today to mark this second Sunday of Advent. This morning I'll be reading from Philippians 1, 15 through 26 as we continue to look and explore the spiritual issue of confidence. I'm going to be reading from the message and you are welcome to follow along in your Bible if you'd like or I would encourage you also to listen as I read the word. This is from Paul. It's true that some here preach Christ because with me out of the way, they think they'll step right into the spotlight. But the others do it with the best heart in the world. One group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I am here defending the message, wanting to help. The others, well, now that I'm out of the picture, are merely greedy, hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Their motives are bad. They see me as their competition, and so the worse it gets for me, the better they think for them. So how am I to respond? I've decided that I really don't care about their motives, whether mixed, bad, or indifferent. Every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed, so I just cheer them on. And I'm going to keep that celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or die. They didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Alive, I'm Christ's messenger, and dead, well, I'm his bounty. Life versus even more life, I can't lose. As long as I'm alive in this body, there's good work for me to do. If I had to choose right now, I hardly know which I'd choose. It's a hard choice. The desire to break camp here and be with Christ is powerful. Some days I, I can think of nothing better, but most days, because of what you're going through, I'm sure that it's better for me to stick it out here. So I plan to be around a while, companion to you as your growth and joy in this life of trusting God continues. You can start looking forward to a great reunion when I come visit you again. We'll be praising Christ and enjoying each other. This is the word of the Lord. I wonder when I read those passages from Paul, Often, where does he get his confidence? This guy is sitting and rotting in jail when he writes this. And not only where does he get his confidence, but how does he find his way around that very human nature that we all have to be right, to be validated, to be affirmed, to be vindicated, to be lifted up as someone who is special and unique? And I wonder how it's possible for him to free himself up from that nature that we all have of competition, competing that plagues all of us and, and makes each of us look at each other and, and other churches and other people with suspicion because we want to be the first and the biggest and the best and we want to be the favorite, the favorite one. At this stage in his life, Paul is an old man and This old man was once hell-bent on ridding the countryside of all of those who followed Christ, even to the point of murdering them. He was so confident in what he believed at that time. And yet, he had this blinding experience of Jesus Christ. And in that blinding experience with the risen Christ, all of that fervor and passion and confidence was shifted away from that fervor to kill and to stop, to spread the news and to give life. I can tell you right now where Paul does not get his confidence. He doesn't get it out of resting on a guaranteed certainty that life would be fair. He doesn't get it out of a guaranteed certainty that he's somehow entitled to be rewarded for all the good that he's going to do. So there's There's something at the end waiting for him. That's not where his confidence comes from. 
And it isn't from the confidence in feeling that everything in life would, well, it would turn out okay for him, that the outcome would always be favorable. So his confidence doesn't rest in what is being promised to him or what he hopes to have in his future, to be exempt from suffering or exempt from what life has to offer. He isn't under the delusion that the message that he brings, the message of hope, depends solely on his abilities as a messenger to razzle-dazzle the crowd. I wonder where this confidence comes from, but more importantly, I would ask us, is this confidence something that each of us has as a part of our promise? This confidence to speak with truth and with boldness, is that something that makes up the fabric of your Christian life? And is it something that we can reach for? I'm not a particularly brave or noble person. And I'm certainly not singularly gifted in music or art or speech. I am very awkward in all sports. I have no rhythm whatsoever for dance. I, I'm no prize beauty. I don't have a commanding presence or a compelling voice. In my early years, I was frightened by all authority, from everybody from the man next door to the principal at school to anyone who was taller than me, which was everyone. I was so frightened by authority that I had no authority of my own. No authority that I could call my own. Confident would be the last word that you would use to describe me. And I've told you some of my story before. I know that with this awkward, very, very ordinary person who has not been exempt from suffering or life's ups and downs, this person decided to go to a Bible college and become the first woman to enroll in the preaching uh, department. And I've shared with you that that was met with a lot of um, disapproval and intimidation, and it was very frightening. But I don't think I shared with you how I got fired from my first job. <laughs> so I'll share that with you now. I was 18 when I was um, in Bible college and trying to be swayed away from doing what I was doing. And I was 21 when I was called as an associate pastor for my very first time. It lasted nine months, just enough time to give birth to something. <laughs> but in that time, I was called, but I was one of the first women to be called as associate pastor. We had a long conversation, the session and I, about were they ready for this, and they assured me that they were. Well, when I had been there a few months, the minister, the pastor, head of staff decided to let me preach. I preached once during that nine months. It was enough. <laughs> and then a family came to me a few months later that I had had a relationship with, and they had a 13-year-old daughter, and she talked. She wanted so much to be baptized, and she wanted me to do the baptism. And so I went to the head of staff, and he thought it was a great idea. I baptized her in, on Sunday morning. And on Monday afternoon, I was called to a special session meeting. At that special session meeting, they said, Now, Jan, we don't mind some of the things that you do. But when you start preaching and baptizing, well, that's just not the place for you. There's no place for you to do that here. And I said, But I thought you were okay with this. And they said, well, we're okay with everything else, but no preaching or baptizing. Well, 30 years later, how does a person who's so ordinary and so uh, really uh, short, <laughs> how does that person stay for 30 years in this ministry and I can tell you this, and I believe it's the same reason that made Paul so confident and also made Mary confident enough to do what she needed to do and Joseph confident enough to do what he needed to do and maybe you confident enough to do what God is calling you to do. 
And that is that our confidence does not lie in our abilities. Our confidence does not lie in the fact that we, we are going to make something happen in our lives. What happened to me was that 30 years ago, I was gripped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It had a hold of me, and it has never let me go. And I knew that all I wanted to do in life was to share with others, creatively or however, what it meant to be gripped by this love of God shown through Jesus Christ. It is my wholehearted belief in the message that I share and in the one who gave the message that has propelled me forward in ministry against the odds to be in a place to share the gospel, whether it's in a Sunday school class or in front of a congregation or at a hospital bed, to share with somebody that there is light in a dark place, that there is hope where there should be only despair, where there is more when death seems like the end. The privilege of sharing that has gripped my heart and soul for 30 years. How can anyone who preaches the true gospel be wrong? How can anyone who has heard the gospel be silent? Didn't the sky open up and the darkness be shattered by the angels shouting glory to the newborn king? Wouldn't the very stones cry out if our lips were silent? Isn't that all true? Paul is in jail, and what the Philippians need from Paul right now is an interpretation. They don't really want to know that he's doing okay, although that's important. They've sent a guy ahead of him, Epaphrodites to see how he's doing. And what they really need is an interpretation because this is what's happened. Paul is a Christian minister. He's a missionary, a preacher of the gospel, and he has been for years and years. Now he's arrested, and he's imprisoned, and he's under the authority of the, of the Romans, and he's probably going to die. Here's a man whose life has been spent night and day, crippled by ministry on behalf of the message, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here is a man who has dedicated his life. If anyone was faithful, it was Paul, and he's sitting in jail. This was a man who dragged his crippled body across two continents to bring the message of hope to anyone who would listen and to many who wouldn't. And now all of a sudden the locomotion has stopped and he's sitting in jail. I think about Paul sitting in that cell. I think about all that energy that he has, a man always on the move. He wrote to his friends and he said, listen, I'm running out of places to preach here. I'm on my way to Rome and then you need to make way for me to make it over to Spain. I've got places to go and people to see and I've got a message to give. And here he is sitting in prison and he's been stopped. And then back at the church at Philippi, some of the people who didn't understand the nature of his confidence, that didn't understand that the gospel message was apart from him, well, they were worried. What's our church going to do? We think we, think we may not make it if Paul's not here. We're going, we're going to go down. They were so worried. We're never going to get anybody else like Paul. I don't know what's going to happen to our church. I just don't know with Paul gone. They were worried about their church. And while they're amusing and reflecting and crying and wringing their hands, a man comes into the church. When the church first heard Paul was in prison, they sent him Epaphrodite. And they said, go over and see what he needs. And so he went over to see what Paul needed. And when he got there, he got really sick. He got so sick that he almost died. And Paul sends him back and, and when he's well enough to travel and sends him back with a letter that basically says, hey, um, I really have enough troubles of my own. I can't be taking care of this sick deacon that you've sent over to take care of me. So thanks. He really tried, but here he is, back to you. That's basically what he says to them. So if 
Epaphrodites comes back. And when he enters the church, the church people say, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I have a letter from Paul, and he wants you to read it in worship. Now, I believe that what Paul has to say at this point is an incubator for the system of confidence. He's setting them straight about where he gets his confidence and where we can get ours. He doesn't hesitate because he's absolutely 110% sure of the message of the gospel. And he's 150% sure of the one who gave him the message. So Paul says, get your mind off of me. I'm not the center of the church. If you're worried about how I'm doing, I'm fine. I'm prepared. I'm prepared to live and I'm prepared to die. With everything I've gone through, let me tell you, with this aching body, there are some days I would be glad to be free of it and let the angels just carry me away to be with Christ. Death is no threat. In fact, if I had my way, I would rather die and be with Christ right now. But I think God has more work for me to do, and so I'm probably going to see you again. In fact, I'm pretty confident of it. And then he goes on. No church can survive built around the preacher. The church is built around Jesus Christ. And until that comes through, quit thinking about me. I'm the one in prison. Christ is not in prison. Christ is the Savior of the church, and Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Preachers will come and preachers will go. Young ones, old ones, tall ones, short ones, ones with mustaches and ones without, good ones and bad ones, but the church, <laughs> one with them and one without, but the church is the church. You have Christ, and I want you to prove to all the prophets of doom, I want you to prove them wrong. And this is what he says. Prove that they're wrong when they say the attendance will go down now that Paul's not around. Prove that they're wrong when they say the offerings are going to drop off now that Paul's not here. Prove them wrong when they say, I think the members will kind of drift off now that Paul's not here. Prove them wrong. And this is finally what he says. Stand together, side by side, confident in Jesus. Confident in Jesus. There are only two things. There are only two things that are absolutely central to the church. Jesus Christ and human need. When you have those two things, you have the church. In that place dwells the church. In that place are the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. There are those who are educated and there are those who aren't. There are those who believe and that there are those who don't believe. There are the high and the mighty and there are the lowly whom nobody knows or cares about. In between is the Church of Christ. The church is called to help both the haves and the have-nots. We have a message for the rich as well as for the poor. The church is to be the gospel for all people. We can be confident in that. As long as you have Christ and as long as you have needs, you have the church. And then Paul says the real proof of his ministry is how the church works in his absence. The real proof of anything that we do is how does it get along without us. The confidence that it takes to be a Christian, and it takes a lot of confidence because it's hard work. It's demanding. And the confidence that it takes to be a Christ follower, it does not come from a guaranteed certainty that life is going to be fair or that you're going to be justly rewarded or that everything will come out okay in your life, that you will not suffer and you will not have pain. Our confidence was born in a manger 
raised on a cross, died on a Friday, and was raised again on the third day. That's the only place our confidence rests. Our confidence lives and breathes and moves with us, bringing us to a place of healing and wholeness and forgiveness. Our confidence comes to a dark sky that rests in our soul. And that confidence appears as a star that shines brighter than all the other stars. And that leads us to the one who loves us. I don't think a week passes when someone, whether new to the church or reading my chart at the doctor's office, or in passing, doesn't um, make a comment about me being a pastor. Every, every week, someone says something. And, you know, some are curious. Some are rude. Some are mean. And some are inspired. And some are, are really very sweet and nice. But I can tell you that these days, after 30 years, when people make a comment about me being in the ministry, this is what I say. I know God picks the most ordinary people. <laughs> Isn't it strange? It never ceases to amaze me. God chooses you. You're not too ordinary for God. Have confidence that God has given you all that you need to be who you need to be in Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you have made us confident with the truth. That you have given us the truth to share, that we need never be embarrassed or hesitant about sharing it. That we need never wait, wondering if the truth will, if the truth will work its transformation, because you are the truth. Hear us, Lord, as we give ourselves to you. As we give our perception of our ordinariness away and claim the authority and uniqueness that you have called each of us as the beloved. We thank you, Lord, that you would change our names, that our new name would be confident. And we pray all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen.